maybe that's why. Yeah, we saw a This is our Animal House. It's our Animal House Q&A. James Gardner, Dwayne Jesse, and Karen Allen, who's on the way. So welcome in traditional children's style. Thank you guys for coming. I'm sure Karen will be here any minute. But to start off, uh, I can ask you. So, uh, what, are, what are your memories of getting cast in that house? Well, first of all, Michael Chinich was the casting director, and uh, I was cast before the girls were cast, and it was kind of cool because there were like 15 girls called in that I read with for Babs and Mandy, and their choices were pretty interesting for the car scenes, you know. Um, and. Uh, he was great. Uh, Michael was wonderful, uh, great casting director, and uh, I think I read about four times before I got the part. Um, but he was a terrific casting director, and uh, you know, there was such a great bunch of characters. So we're asking about uh, the casting, casting of it, how we got cast. Yeah. My turn. <laughs> Karen Allen. He's just asking. <laughs> the question is how we got cast in the film? Or about the casting process and, you know. Did you answer already? Oh, no. Uh, you go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> okay. So, uh, mine is a really funny story. I was, I was, uh, I started working as an actress in Washington, D.C. in the theater. And then I moved to New York City and I'd been there maybe just two or three months. And I had decided to study at the Lee Strasberg Institute because I thought he was an interesting teacher and I thought it might be a, 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 you know, a good experience for me. And I was just walking through the lobby one day and on the bulletin board I saw a little 3 by 5 card that said, Feature Film Casting College Age Actors and Actresses Send Picture and Resume 2. I just wrote it down on a little pad and stuck a picture and a resume in. And I was 25, but I looked a little young for my age. And I thought, you know, I can squeak by being a college student. And about three or four days later, I got a phone call, and it was a casting director at Universal Pictures, and she said, um, you know, we'd like to meet you for this film. So I, I went in, and I was very impressed, because it was on Park Avenue, the offices of, of Universal, and, I had not only never done a film before, I had never even met a single actor or a single person who'd ever worked in a film in my entire life. I really had no ambition to be in films. My real ambition was to make a living working in the theater. But there I was and I walked in and the casting director, Dee Dee Well, walked over to me and she said, I know you don't have an agent, I know you're not in the union, but you're coming in to meet John Landis because you're my girl. And she, she like clapped me on the shoulder like that. And it, it turned out, I found out later, she just, she saw this photograph of me, which was from a play I had done in Washington, D.C., and somehow I just looked like 
how she pictured Katie looking. Right. So um, I then I heard you say you auditioned four times. I think I auditioned four times in New York, and then they had me fly to Los Angeles, and I had to get up in front of what they call the suits, yeah. which are, are the executives at Universal who all sit there kind of like this, you know, like show scary, me. scary, scary. <laughs> Show me, she's the one. And my other little funny aside is, by that time, when I auditioned in New York, I auditioned with Harold Ramis, who really wanted to play Boone, but John Landis didn't want him to play Boone. And somebody else who wanted to play Boone, they didn't get the part. And then by the time I went to Los Angeles, they had cast Peter Riegert. And I had, at that time in my life, I had one good pair of shoes and one nice pair of pants, other than like jeans with holes in them or kind of some sort of funky shoe. So I wore my one good pair of shoes on the plane and my one nice pair of pants. And the, the shoes were had a kind of stacked heel and the pants were, I guess, hemmed so that they worked with this one good pair of shoes with the stacked heel. And I showed up and as soon as I walked in, these shoes made me about three inches taller than Peter Rieger. And I thought, oh, that's not going to be good. If we go in audition, I'm like taller than Peter. So I had to decide, was I going to lose the shoes and go in my socks with my pants three inches too long and not be the same height as Peter? Or was I going to go in there with my shoes on and be taller than Peter? So I decided to lose the shoes. <laughs> I walked in in my stocking feet, and I thought I gave a truly terrible audition. And I got back on the plane and was like almost in tears, because for some reason I'd kind of gotten to like all those guys. I was like, I want to do this film. And uh, I flew back on the plane, like, oh, yeah. And I got home and there was a, a message saying, you got the part. <laughs> yeah. My story is a little different. I had been like two or three films for uni, and then up at Universal, and they offered me the part. And I said, nope, nope, I don't think I want to do it. Nope, nope, nope. So I was on my way out the door, and a voice came in the back of my head, I swear to God, this is the truth. A voice came in the back of my head and said, take it. Take it, and I took it, and it changed my life. It's interesting because we've done a few of these today already, a few of these Q and A's panels, and a couple of people I've asked questions about how did you get a, a, your role that we're talking about at the moment, and quite a few people think they didn't get it. And you might have heard that today a few times. You know, they, they thought, "Why well, did I, I felt I wasn't on top, or I didn't want it anyway, but I just went in for it," or and they all got the role, which is really interesting. Well, I'll give it another little funny aside. Is John Landis told me later that the only reason I got the part, because Universal was really kind of against casting people who had never been on film before. And I was one of those people. I had no credits on film. I had like some theater credits. But the, it was down to me and another actress, who I don't know who it was, who had done a lot of television work in Los Angeles, and that was a little bit of a known quantity. Only in the scene that we were auditioning where, you know, I, the Katie storms out of the frat house and there's that scene where she says, oh yeah, great, you and your friends going up to my parents' cabin. For some reason, the other girl who Universal really wanted couldn't do the scene without crying. Like she was crying every time she did it. And John Landis she was taking her and he was saying, no, it's a comedy. It's, a comedy. it's, good. She, it's not that serious to her. Don't, it's not, you know, she's not, her, he's not breaking her heart here. And she would, he would give her that little instruction and then they'd do it again. And she'd cry again. And so John said, I really only got the part by default because I didn't get her to do it without crying. Whereas I, it never occurred to me that Katie would cry in the scene. It just didn't cross my mind. So, James, what is, what is a moment from uh, working on this movie that really st stuck in your mind all these years? Well, I had just shot out a little beach film called Malibu Beach, and I was about. Mm -hmm three days late getting to Eugene. 
and the Animal House guys had really been working together to get their thing together, you know. And the next morning we were going to go for haircuts, we were going to cut in 1962. And so I go out and I say hi to Tom Holst, which is the only person I knew in the cast at that point. And John Landis comes and he says, hey everybody, this is James Dutton, he plays uh, head of Omega House. And all the Animal House guys all together go, fuck you! <laughs> I took about three giant steps back, and uh, that was my introduction to them all. And uh, well, I proceeded to have four wonderful weeks of my life, and we had a great time shooting. And another favorite time of mine was uh, I, I really loved Belushi already. I loved him from Saturday Night Live. I was a real fan. And when we did the uh, the cafeteria scene. Uh, I had a line to Belushi where I said, don't you have any respect for yourself? And Belushi cracked up laughing for four takes. Every time we got to it, he'd, I'd say that line and he would just fall apart. You know, and I loved that. I felt like, that, okay, I'm doing my job here. You know? And that was extremely fulfilling to me. You know? Those are two memories in particular that I have. They're good memories for me. Same, same question for you. What's, I mean, what, what really stuck out for you when you worked on that movie? You know what did, you know, the way John Landis worked us, you know, he, 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 they called him a maniac, but I didn't think so. I think he's a nice guy. But he, 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 he wanted a shot. When he wanted a shot, he wanted a shot. You know what I mean? No matter how long it took. And he worked with us. He worked with us. The, 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 the scene that I really liked is, um, when we did the, um, the Gator. You know the part when they get on the floor and saw each other? That was a ball, boy. John Lynch had me giant. I had a ball, that ball. But yeah, that's what was wrong. Great scene. Yeah. Okay, uh, go back to Karen too. <laughs> what do you think is the last, you know, what do you think is one of the reasons the lasting effect and popularity of Animal House all these years later? You know, it, I think it's just a truly wonderfully written and acted film. And I, I, I think, you know, when, when I see it, you know, this is now 40 years later or something, it really, really makes me laugh. And it's now has become, I guess it was always politically incorrect, although political incorrectness really didn't figure into much, you know, back in the late 70s. But, um, uh, you know, I think you, you couldn't really make a film like this today. I mean, it would just be, people would be all over it, you know, criticizing um, all of its, like, wild... What, what's great about it is it's politically incorrect about everything, so you don't really have to, like, worry about somebody, like, focusing on any particular area of, of uh, rudeness. It's just the whole, the whole movie's rude, in a way. But... Um, I don't know, you know, it, it captures something unique. And I, it may have just been the fact that it, it is based on reality. It's based on Chris Miller's real experience, you know, at his particular college in this particular time. So it's very specific, but it's also, I, mean, I think there is a universal aspect to it of that idea of going off to college and getting your freedom for the first time and, you know, I think a little bit kind of universally how everybody just goes slightly apeshit for a while, you know. I, I think also <laughs> it's a fact that there's such a gamut of characters. It's like everybody you ever knew in school right. is there somewhere. I mean, you know, from the big man on campus to the, you know, I mean, like when I take the guys to the couch, all the, <laughs> the rejection couch in the, in the first scene. <laughs> Everybody was represented, and I think that's part of it. There's a universality about it, you know. Yeah, yeah. I think that was part of its success. And there were three wonderful writers. I mean, Doug Kenny, who came out of uh, National Lampoon, uh, the magazine, uh, was brilliant. All three of the writers were brilliant writers. And there's their vignettes, each of them. Uh, it was just a lot of fun to do. We had a blast. Yeah. We had an absolute and, blast. And Belushi it? gives one of the great, almost silent comedy performances, you know, yeah. of a film. And then sadly was gone a couple of years later. So I think that that has also sustained, sustained the film because it really is, you know, he did do other films, but I don't know that, that his comic genius is really captured in any of them as much as in Animal House. 
movie with the Blues Brothers. Yeah, I was on that set too. It was a fun yeah. set to be on. But not as um, much. No, no, not as much, I don't think, though. Yeah. And not as many interesting characters. I mean, we had really a great bunch of characters. We no, I mean, great. like, but Belushi's timing and stuff. Well, it was a different character than I did entirely anyway in the Blues Brothers, but there was another success. It was good, yeah. yeah. It was fun. So, doing that, playing that character that you did yes. in the movie and that whole mini thing going on there, how did John Landis approach you about approaching that? He just told me to do it. Do it? He just said, do it. He just said, do it. I said, oh, okay. <laughs> did it. I just went for it, eh? <laughs> so, I told you, because I like working with John. So he either told me to jump out the window or he did it. Okay. John Landis had an enthusiasm about him that just got us all going, too. He really brought us together. And he's an amazing storyteller that in between yeah. takes, he can tell you a million stories about the movies and wonderful stories. I mean, we would all be on just listening to him. But he really brought us together and he led us to do our own thing, do our own choices, which was wonderful. And then sometimes he might give you a 180 in direction, a completely different thing to do, which makes it very interesting, uh, you know. So we brought different sides out of our, within a scene. He just made it, he made it fun, and I think that was the, what it was all about, just the fun we had together, and it shows, you know? So, uh, this is a full house here. So, anybody have questions? Oh, okay, you, sir. Okay, one of the parts, the same parts of the movie was the parade sequence. And we do like a comment on the it was a great, we, we were in Cottage Grove outside of Eugene and it took almost a week to shoot it. And, uh, well, okay. it was a lot of fun, you know. Um, it, it was quite a few set setups that scene with all the various floats and everything. It was, uh, we just had a great time. And uh, the other actors, John Vernon, such a wonderful man, great actor, so delightful to work with. Um, Verna Bloom. Who we um, just lost. She just passed oh, away yeah, yeah, a couple yeah. weeks ago. Or Cesare De Nova. All three of them are gone now. And all three of them were just lovely to work with. You know, I, I loved being with them. And uh, they were all very giving, each of them. Yeah. Uh, and Verna was really delightful. You know, she came out of Broadway years ago. She played Charlotte Corday, I think, in Murat Saad early, early, long ago in New York. And boy, she's just got a great cross-section of work of things she's done, and it was lovely, you know. I think we were just blessed to get them. And Donald Sutherland, I mean, he made more money than anyone else on the picture, you know, yeah. <laughs> for what he did. But uh, he's quite an amazing actor, too. There's someone that will do uh, little cameos and things, and anything he does uh, turns to gold, I think, you know. We were lucky to have him, too. Yes? You always seem to play really like feisty, spunky characters in the films that you were in. How close are you in real life to the characters that you played? You know, I don't know. I mean, you know, you know I've never punched anybody in the face. I've thought about it. I don't know. I think I certainly have aspects of those kind of characters in in, in me, and I and I think I. I have always been when I, I read a character who really has, you know, a real uh, fighting spirit. I always respond to those characters, maybe more so than, than uh, you know, characters that are more passive or more, you know, victims. I always, I kind of like people who just rise up and stand up for themselves. Um, so I, I think, you know, I have, I've had a tendency to choose characters like that and then of course you know how the film industry works once you do something and you're successful at it they you know that, that's kind of like all the you know the only thing they can see you doing is playing those kind of characters so i've had to really fight against that and choose roles like laura in the glass menagerie or choose kind of characters that go against that so that so that because you kind of want to you want to be able to go in in many different directions as an actor you don't want to get sort of you know, stuck in a certain type of, of character. It's just less interesting. 
it's true in Hollywood. They always once you do something, they want you to keep doing it. And it's very yeah, and it's very frustrating because you don't. As an actor, you want to be versatile. You want to do different things. So I mean, because they kept wanting me to play Marmalade, and I didn't want to keep playing Marmalade. I wanted to do other things, you know. And so you got to fight that in Hollywood, I think. You know, by by your choices and what you say no to and yes to. Uh, actually. Uh about two weeks ago, a film of yours was shown at the San Francisco Film Festival, yeah. Colwell, and Hollywood Reporter and Variety both gave you very, very good uh, citations in that. They, they really spoke well, because it's entirely, actually, to what you were speaking of, it's an entirely different part for you. It's a yeah. quiet film, it's a, but they said that you were incredible, and they, actually, yeah. Hollywood Reporter said it's like, it's like your comeback, where you've been. It's just very strange, but it's like you've always but I, been around. I play a very passive character in it. I play a woman who kind of has the rug pulled out from under her, and instead of really being able to stand up and fight for herself, she has to deal with a kind of fragility inside of her, and and she she goes more in the direction of accepting her fate as opposed to fighting her fate, which. I found very difficult to do, <laughs> but it was interesting to explore, like, you know, what what happens to, you know, somebody who doesn't have that kind of fighting spirit in them, or who, who maybe did once but doesn't anymore, um, so it was, inter it was interesting. No, it was a very timely too, because I said, oh, you're coming here, I can ask about that. So, <laughs> so James, uh, I have a question, so you, you uh, after Animal House and around that time period, you were a familiar face on a lot of TV shows, television shows. And I remember one of them was The Planet of the Apes, and I remember that one pretty much. I love my Planet of the Apes. It was a fun series. Thank you. Yeah, because it was, well, they did a, a few Planet of the Apes movies yes. before the series came out. But I, the first movie blew me away. I mean, I loved it. It was a wonderful film. Uh, but it was such a great cast, so many great character actors in that series. And I love playing that character because he sort of led the rebellion. Uh, we were very oppressed by the apes. And I got the rebellion going and then I got shot dead. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, but it, was, <laughs> but it was fun. Uh, it was a delightful set and it's quite amazing. Those, those makeup jobs they did, those, uh, what do they call them, appliances, they put on in pieces on them, it was quite a process that would take a couple of hours to do. And when you get on that set with these wonderful actors and you see those human eyes, and then you, you see that little bit of mouth tie, it was like very bizarre. Um, but I worked with Roddy McDowell, who was one of the loveliest men I ever worked with, um, who we've all loved in a million things, you know. Um, it was really fun. It was a delightful show to work on and enjoy it. And for you, I have a question. So, you've, you've had a music career as Otis Day. Yeah. Yeah, so tell us about that. And you know what? People forget I'm an actor for real. You know, they say, oh, God, get Otis to sing. I want to act again. And I also like to sing. I might, do, I might sing tonight at the day. So, I don't know. We, we did a commercial together yeah, yeah. in Madrid in about 2005. It was for Aquafina Water, and it was a takeoff on Animal House. But uh, Niedermeyer, or Mark Metcalf, and yeah. I played two cops that yeah. come up to bust this party. This place looks excellent. just like the Animal House. And we go in and we're going to bust up the party. And you're in there singing the song, and we end up on the dance floor with our water flying everywhere. And I love it. way out. It was I actually to be really one of good. Those Animal House guys instead of Greg Marmalade. They were having all the fun, you know. So I finally did it. We had a great time doing that. Yeah, it was, yes, it was yes. fun. I wish this could go on all day, but we actually have come to the end of this because we have another one. Oh, we've come to the end of the lollipop. But thank you guys for coming, and thank you all for coming to. Thank you guys. Thank you guys. Thank you guys. Appreciate you. Guys.